How you doing, guys? <laughs> um, I have the distinct privilege of bringing the room down because my first, I'm going to actually do two stories. Um, I'm kind of ancillary in these stories. I experienced them, but I was not the main protagonist and antagonist in these stories. Yes, I can. Sorry. <laughs> um, so uh, just to start, I was a police officer. I was born and raised in Colorado. I'm a Colorado boy. Um, I was a police officer in Colorado for uh, just about uh, 16 years. <clears throat> Started out as a patrol officer and uh, very quickly got tired of chasing drunks and bar fights and uh, decided that I wanted to do something more fun. So uh, I went down to Denver and became a member of the SWAT team. Uh, so that was a uh, good choice. I, uh, I actually, um, the way my career kind of went, um, I, I actually, my first call, my first call out as a SWAT team member uh, was Columbine. So came out of training, I was a SWAT member for three days, and then Columbine happened. Um, so that was my first experience with SWAT. Um, I have been on a gang task force, I was on a drug task force, uh, I was on a SWAT team, and my last tour of duty for about four and a half years was as a uh, sex crimes unit investigator. Um, <clears throat> specifically, I worked mostly with crimes against children, um, but uh, I did all aspects of every, everything, seen it all. Um, so, the, the story, the, so growing up, my father was a, he's a, a, a retired drill instructor in the Marine Corps. Hoorah. Okay. Um, he, his saying that he gave to me, uh, he used to say to me all the time, was it is better to have and not need than to need and not have. And I grew up with that saying over and over and over again. And as I got more involved in martial arts and more involved in kickboxing, I was a competitive Muay Thai kickboxer for a long time. Um, I've got the requisite scars and been hitting the head enough. If I do pause, I'm sorry, it's because I've been hitting the head a lot. Um, but uh, I, um, I kind of carried that with me, and I use that in my self-defense classes. Um, my sergeant created what is called RAD, which is Rape and Aggression Defense. Um, and what he did actually was go around to prisons in Colorado and Wyoming and Utah, and he actually interviewed serial rapists who were caught because someone got away. And he went in and he said, what did she do to you? How did she get away from you? She was five foot two. 100 pounds, you're six foot four, 225 pounds. How'd she get away from you? Some of them was obvious. One guy had, no, had one eye, he was missing one eye because she stuck her finger in his eye and actually took his eye out of his head. He stopped fighting, okay? That was the end of the fight. Uh, one guy was missing part of his ear because she reached up and just ripped his ear off his head. Um, and some of the faces you guys are making, I, I, I address that in my classes too with, they're gonna do something to you that you're gonna carry with you for the rest of your life, you're never gonna get over it. So who cares what happens to them, okay? Um, but anyway, so what I'm going to talk about is um, having and not needing, needing and not having. Okay? So my first story uh, is going to be about a woman named Kelly. Okay? Uh, this is the not nice story, sorry. And I'm also going to be very honest and graphic with what I'm going to talk about. Okay? So Kelly was a single 31-year-old woman living in Denver, Colorado. She was uh, on track to become a prosecutor for the state of Colorado. Uh, she worked at a law firm, and uh, for all intents and purposes, she had a wonderful friend. She was a wonderful, wonderful woman. Uh, she went out with her friends one night and met a guy at a bar. And he wanted to go take a walk down Wazee Street. So they walked down Wazee Street, and they went uh, through a parking lot down by Coors Field, if any of you have ever been to uh, Denver. And in the parking lot at Coors Field, um, he started to try to kiss her, and he was grabbing on her. Um, she told him that it wasn't, this wasn't the time, it wasn't this, how, this one how she wanted it. Um, he became more insistent, they began to argue. Um, and I don't have a lot of time, so long story short. Um, as he argued, uh, he got closer and closer until he was right in her face. And when he got up in her face, he grabbed her by the throat, he punched her five or six times in the face, broke her jaw, broke her nose, cracked her orbital, picked her up by the neck and the arm, slammed her on the ground, and then he raped her. Uh, when he was done raping her, now, he sat next to her and tried to talk to her to get her to not go to the police, not tell anybody what had happened, said he would take her to the hospital, he'd pay for her doctor's bills. Um, she, he said she mumbled something kind of unintelligible, but it, to the point that she was going to go to the police. So he got angry and he beat her some more. Uh, she went semi-conscious and he thought that he had killed her. So he tried to decide what he was going to do. So he left her, went and got in his car, because they were in the parking lot near his car, went and got in his car, started his car up to leave, and then shut his car off, went back, went over to her, checked her pulse, she still had a pulse. So then he paced around in the parking lot, trying to decide what to do, and then he finally made a decision. Uh, this is a not nice part. 
so the coroner said that um, she was in a semi-conscious state, but the coroner said that she was alive when he started to try to cut her head off. Um, his knife was not sharp enough, and he was surprised at how, and this is what he told me, he was surprised at how tough the muscle and the, and the tendons in her neck were. Um, the coroner said that once he, he hit the carotid artery, she probably exsanguinated in, in about 10 to 15 seconds. Uh, when he reached her spine, he quit because he couldn't cut through the spine. Uh, I saw the knife marks on her neck during the autopsy. Okay. Um, he took his knife, he threw it in the sewer, he sat down next to her and he cried. Then he masturbated on her and he drove, drove away. Okay. Um, she was found at 3.30 in the morning by a couple coming out of a bar um, in the parking lot. By 6 o'clock in the morning, he was in our, our offices being interviewed. Um, all the stuff I told you, he told me to my face. When I asked him what she did when he got in her face, he said nothing. He said, I got right up three inches from her face, was screaming at her. When I grabbed her by the throat, I held her by the throat and screamed at her for 30, 40 seconds, almost a minute. She did nothing. She never screamed. She never fought back. And the one thing he said to me was, she never said no. Never even said no. Didn't do anything to help herself. Okay? Story number one, that's Kelly. Okay? Okay, so story number two is Gina. Gina's one of my favorite stories ever. I, I actually told Rain this story. <laughs> so uh, Gina, same scenario. Gina was actually 32 years old. She was a single woman living in Denver. Uh, she came home from the grocery store one night and there was a naked man in her apartment uh, who tried to sexually assault her. So he attacked her and she told me, literally to my face, he punched me and I looked at him and I said, oh no, you didn't, and I punched him back. Okay? She fought with him for approximately two minutes around her apartment and ended up getting a hold of his testicles, which she squeezed for all she was worth, twisted and pulled on. He went down screaming in agony. She dragged him. Now, mind you, he was not, he was in a fetal position on the ground. He was not crawling. He was not helping her with his arms. He wasn't walking. He was on a fetal position. She dragged him 22 and a half feet from one side of her apartment all the way into her kitchen so she could get the phone, so she could call 911. She got the phone. She turned around. She dragged him back into the living room, sat down on her coffee, on her, on her, uh, on her, co on her couch, excuse me, dialed 911 was on the phone with the operator. The operator said, what's your emergency? She said, there's a naked white man in my house. He tried to rape me, but I got him by the balls. Okay. 911 operator said, police will be there. The police are on their way. They'll be, be there in a couple of minutes. I'll stay on the line with you. She's on the line with the woman, with Gina. We knock on the door. One minute, and I think it was like 39 seconds later, we walked, we knocked on her door. Normally, somebody comes to the door and opens it. All we hear is, come in! We walk in the, parking, in, in the apartment. She's on the couch. He's under the coffee table. She's got a cell phone in one hand and his testicles in the other. I walked over. I said, it's OK. You can release him. We'll take him from here. She says, no, I'm not letting go. I said, what do you mean you're not letting go? She said, I'm not letting go until he's in handcuffs. You put the handcuffs on him, I'll let go. I said, OK. Took one arm, put the cuff on it. I said, you can let go now. She said, uh-uh, both arms. He's on his side, wrestled around, got his arm behind him, put him in handcuffs. I said, you can let go now. She said, thank you, and she let go. Okay. When she came down for her interview, I asked her what the first thing she thought when she came to, into her, walked into her apartment and there was a naked man standing in her apartment. And the first thing she said to me was, I knew what he was there for. And I said, I'm not going to be a victim. He's not getting me. It's not going to happen. So she fought. And that was the result of her fight, because he thought that he was going to go in this room, in this apartment, and he was going to get this. She was about five foot two, about 120 pounds of pure fire, because she beat the crap out of this guy. I mean, not only the testicle thing, but eye swollen shut, busted lip, big cut on his chin. Um, but she said, I'm not going to be a victim. It's not going to happen to me. Right? Gina took one self-defense class. 
one single self-defense class. And I will advertise for myself, it was my self-defense class. But she took one self-defense class. All right. And that gave her enough confidence in herself and her abilities to not be a victim, to just go with this guy. A guy who was bigger and stronger than she was, who thought he was just going to have his way with her. Um, and he didn't. He ended up uh, losing both of his testicles uh, and spending, he was a serial rapist actually. He had raped uh, five other women and that was his MO. He thought that by being naked he wasn't leaving evidence at the scene, which is completely wrong, but um, that was his mind. So um, two different stories, one not so nice, um, one a little, little better, okay? Um, but the whole thing, guys, is don't be a victim, okay? You can have it and not need it. But if you need it and don't have it, it can be very bad. By the way, um, the guy that uh, killed um, Kelly, is, uh, he was a, uh, also, he had raped five or six other women. Um, she was the first one he killed. He put one in the hospital in a coma. She was the first one that he ended up murdering. Um, he, she was the last one that he ever touched. Uh, he is in the Supermax in Pueblo, Colorado uh, for the rest of his existence. So, and he's probably not living a happy life, not in Supermax. Nope. <laughs> not as a rapist. But, so if you take anything away from this, guys, please, um, take a class. It doesn't have to be mine, okay? But take a class, gain that confidence. If you're going to walk out of the mall or walk down the street in Durham at 11.30, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the morning, whatever, okay, don't stare at your phone. That's what they're looking for. Be aware of your surroundings. Be aware of your proximity. Put your key between your fingers. And hit him with your key. Anything. But just don't be a victim. Okay? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>